Welcome everybody to Learn to Sew by Hand. My name is Dana. I am the editor of Fave Crafts and I will be emceeing today's class with Rebecca George. A couple housekeeping things before we get started. We are recording right now. We are gonna send the recording via email tomorrow in about 24 hours. So if we're moving quickly or you just wanna rewatch and become more of a hand sewing master, you can keep an eye out for that email. You'll have the access to the recording forever. So that will come to your inbox tomorrow. If you have questions over the course of the webinar, um, I will be directing them to Rebecca. So go ahead and write them in the chat or in the Q&A feature, and we'll do our best to address any questions. Um, hopefully we can get to everybody. If not, you'll have the recording. So hopefully that'll be a good resource for you. Um, I also want to go ahead and thank the sponsor for our class today. We're really excited to offer today's class for free because we are sponsored by We Like Sewing magazine. We Like Sewing is a totally digital magazine that recently launched. Um, and as a thank you for participating in today's class, they are offering a 90% discount to sign up. So for a one-year membership to the We Like Sewing Gold Club, you get six digital issues of the magazine. You get access to various collections. They'll release seasonal collections like uh, fall shawls, for example, um, or you know, spring handbags. Um, you'll get access to a year's worth of collections. Uh, and what's most exciting, I think, about this digital format is when you sign up for the magazine, you get access to, a, to, to all of the back issues and all of the previously published patterns. So um, that's kind of an advantage of a digital format at, uh, over print. You get access to everything that's ever been published. So for 90% off, you can get this deal. It's $5 US and it's welikesewing.com slash webinar 22. And I will include that link in the chat uh, once I'm done talking. Now I'd like to introduce Rebecca. So Rebecca George is a handmade blogger and she's the owner of Chicago-based fashion line, Purple and Lime. She's originally a Cincinnati native, studied art history and geology at the University of Michigan and earned another degree in the UK um, in fashion design and marketing. While living there, she had several pieces from her graduation collection featured in the fashion magazine ID. She also had the honor to work on belt pouches for the movie Elizabeth, the Golden Age, which won an Oscar for Best Costume. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are so excited for this class. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Don't we see good? anyone saying anything different. <laughs> okay, perfect. Hi, um, I am so excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. And a big thank you to Fave Crafts and to our sponsor, We Like Sewing, um, who I also do some writing for. So check them out. They have really beautiful projects on there. I am really excited to talk about the essential skill of sewing by hand. Whether you're gonna be making a quick repair or sewing an entire project by hand, like the pin I'm wearing now, this was all sewn by hand. There are many times when hand sewing is needed or necessary. This class will cover all the top tips for learning to sew by hand. We will review the primary supplies you will need, how to thread a needle, sewing on buttons, joining fabrics, and much more. To get started, you might be wondering when and why you should hand sew instead of using a sewing machine. Hand sewing is useful for when a machine is not available, to hold fabrics together temporarily, for making quick repairs, for sewing delicate fabrics, for attaching adornments and connecting uh, connectors and closures, which I'll show you, for getting to hard to reach places on a garment, and for making crafts with a more rustic look with visible stitching. All right, let's talk about the materials and supplies that are commonly used to sew by hand. Can everybody see this screen here with the supplies? Perfect. All right, so here are a lot of the materials that you will need for hand sewing, and this could vary based on your project. All right, 
So I'm going to go through a few of these and show you examples. The first, obviously, are hand sewing needles. And hand sewing needles are available in a variety of sizes and uh, thicknesses and lengths. And you really want to pick what is best for your project based on the fabric you are using um, and the kind of thread you're going to be using. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But generally, a longer, bigger type embroidery needle you'll use for uh, fabric with thicker knits and chunkier wools and, and felt. Uh, finer needles to be used for thinner materials like cottons, et cetera. Great. Uh, you will also probably need a thimble. Um, these are two closed end thimbles. They also come with an open end. I prefer this side. It's really easy for pushing a uh, needle through and it'll help protect your hand. Great. Um, you will also need sewing thread. I'm sure everybody has spools of thread around. Um, there are literally endless colors uh, and variety. I am gonna be using today an all-purpose sewing thread in these two different colors. And then I'm also gonna be using an, a thicker kind of thread, which is called an embroidery floss. This is partly so you can see a little more easily when I'm sewing by hand here. Okay, uh, I have two kinds of scissors with me here today. I have a smaller pair that's for making quick snips and cutting thread. And then I also have a pair of fabric scissors. And this is like the name implies for cutting fabric. And you can also use that for thread, et cetera. I have a seam ripper here, which is uh, designed to take out any mistake stitches or to um, loosen any old threads if you're making a repair. This is very handy. I have pins, the so straight pins at the ball on the end. And then I have a pin cushion to keep them secure. Otherwise, uh, pins could get a little bit messy everywhere. This here is a threader, and this comes with most sewing kits. I have here sequins and beads, adornments that are gonna be sewn on, along with snaps, which are two parts, hook and eyes, which are also two parts, and a variety of buttons. And buttons come with either a single loop, or they can be flat with two holes, Sometimes they have four holes, like a more traditional button. They come in quite a big variety, just like thread. Okay, great. Uh, also, we are gonna be working with fabrics today. So I have a few different kinds of material with me. I have a fleece fabric in a few different colors. I have felt, which is made from recycled bottles, craft felt, and then I also have a denim, which I'm gonna be showing you the repairs on. Okay, so I recommend keeping these sample swatches for the future so you can continue practicing with them and um, you can refer back to them if you, you know, need to double check how to do a certain technique. All right, so before showing you some basic hand sewing techniques, uh, I want to go over a few tips for safe hand sewing. I recommend always wearing shoes or hard soled slippers in your sewing room. Use a thimble to protect your fingers and to push the needle through more easily. Use a pin cushion to keep your pins together. Replace any bent or broken needles, just like when you're using a sewing machine. You wanna cover your seam ripper, et cetera, when not in use. And don't be like me and get the, and the cap stuck on so you can't get it back off. And you wanna double check for pins and needles after each sewing session. And you can even get like a giant magnet that you could sweep the floor with if you have this problem. Okay, great. We are gonna start with the hands-on portion of today's class. I wanna first quickly review how to thread a hand sewing needle. I'm sure most of us know how to do this already, but it is a basic skill that is essential for hand sewing. So, Um, speaking of threads, yes. we have a yes. question. Yes, was there a question? Yeah. What are the pros and cons of spool thread versus embroidery floss? That's a great question. 
Embroidery floss is definitely thicker, so it would be harder to get through every kind of material. Um, and it has more visible, like single strands that you can pull off. So it's a little more rustic, like I mentioned before. Um, so that could be a pro or a con that it's thicker and you can see it more easily. So it just depends on the kind of project you're working on. Great, thanks. Right. Sure. So we are gonna be threading a needle here. So you're gonna take the eye of the needle. Hopefully everybody can see. So that's the little hole there. And then you're gonna take your thread up through the bottom. and then pull it through. Now, if you're having trouble getting the, uh, the thread through the eye of the needle, you can always do the old school trick of wetting it a little bit. And then you wanna make sure it's really cut on a point and cut cleanly because the needle is much, much harder to thread if it's like straggly and has little strands coming off of it um, from the, the thread. Okay, great. Um, so you can also use a needle uh, needle threading tool if need be. Once you have your needle threaded, you can either knot it at the bottom with a double width or with a single width. No matter which uh, thickness you're gonna be doing, this, the double thickness is obviously a little stronger when you're sewing on buttons and everything. No matter which thickness you do, single or double, you wanna make sure you knot it at the end. And I recommend not pulling off like too much thread at one time. Otherwise that makes it really easy to get a huge knot when you're sewing. So I would prefer instead of pulling a lot of thread at one time, instead to re-thread if you need to. Okay, great. Do we have any questions? All right. Yeah, we have two, two great ones. Um, if we have time, Christine is wondering if you can demonstrate using the needle threader. Sure. All right. And then Linda is asking, maybe you could answer as you thread. Um, yes. Linda's asking, when do you use single or double thread? Oh, that's also a great question. Okay, so for the single or double thread, that would primarily depend on your project. Um, if you're working with like a really fine fabric, like a silk or something that you don't wanna leave holes in, then I would recommend a single um, single thread. But if you're working with something that is thicker and you want a little more security, then use the double. Now I put the thread through this little threader tool here. I... Hopefully this works. It's been a little while since I've used one of these. Apologies if not. You're just a little bit outside the camera lens. There we go. I feel like those oh, geez, I'm having trouble <laughs> getting it through this. I think my needle is too small. So um, at the end, I will show you guys how to do that with a slightly thicker needle, if that's okay. That sounds good. Right. And apologies if anybody can't see. So we are going to have a threaded needle, and then we are going to talk now about hand sewing stitches. So I'm going to move this over. All right, and I'm going to show you all a variety of hand sewing stitches that you can do for a lot of different kinds of projects. All right, so I'm going to be using the embroidery thread, like I mentioned before, just because it's a little easier to see on the camera. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna be covering five different simple kinds of stitches with you today. And I'm gonna first show you on here, and then I'm gonna show you um, by demonstrating how to do them all. The first one here is a running stitch. Then you have a back stitch here. Then we have a basting stitch. 
then we have a whip stitch, and then at the end here is what's called a blanket stitch, okay? Um, most of these, except for perhaps the blanket stitch, you would do with a finer thread, just like a regular sewing thread here, um, but I am using the embroidery thread now, so you can all see. Okay, great. Um, so the first one, like I mentioned, is called a running stitch. And that is used for a variety of projects and purposes. It involves simply going up and down through the fabric and keeping a small space between each hole. The stitches should be in a straight line. So we're gonna start at one end with, excuse me, with a knotted thread. We're gonna go up through the end, down, at an equal measurement. And then up to another equal measurement there. So this is just a really simple stitch. It's good for basic projects. Um, as you could see here, if you do it with the embroidery floss versus a thinner thread, you get this kind of visible thread look, which is really nice for craft projects, etc. Okay, great. So the second one, the second one is called a back stitch here. And like the name implies, it is involved going backwards with your needle instead of forwards. All right, so the back stitch is considered a very strong and sturdy hand stitch. It uh, to create a back stitch, you want to go up through the fabric from the wrong side, like we started the other one. And then you want to go backwards instead of going forwards. So you want to go back and then up through your fabric again. Okay. Then you want to bring your needle backwards again. So it covers the stitch. It's a very strong stitch. It's often used for couture sewing. It really, really will hold things in place. So you want to double back over each stitch. And it's okay if it overlaps a little bit too. As you can see here, it overlaps a tiny bit and creates a really thick, strong hand sewing stitch. Okay? All right. So the third stitch I am going to show you is called a basting stitch. And this is a really uh, useful stitch because it's long and wide and you can use this um, to hold fabrics in place during a project and also to gather fabrics. You would pull it to gather fabrics. To gather fabrics if you wanna create ruffles or ease um, in like the top of a sleeve or an armhole, uh, that kind of area of a garment. It's usually meant to be temporary and will be removed later. So leave a thread tail like you see here. I did not clip it off cleanly like other ones. Leave a little thread tail so um, you can pull it out later and don't tie it off at the end, okay? Um, so a basting stitch is a very wide stitch. And it's loose, you don't want to pull it really tight. In general, when you're sewing, unless you're going to be gathering, you don't want to be pulling your material very tight. So it's literally a wide, loose stitch. And if you're like working with something that's very slippery, this is useful. Okay. All right, so moving on, we're gonna talk about the whip stitch. And the whip stitch is a diagonal stitch that is done relatively quickly. This kind of stitch is often used to connect two fabrics. A smaller version you might have seen of the whip stitch is called a slip stitch, and that is often used for hemming skirts and pants. And that involves, you know, pulling up a hem and then doing a very small catch of the fabric underneath here. And that is a slip stitch. It's a kind of whip stitch. 
Um, slip stitch is much less visible on the right side of the fabric than the whip stitch. As you can see here, that is a very visible stitch. Okay, so very quickly to do a whip stitch, you again, start on the wrong side of the material. And this is an easy stitch because it is like a one motion stitch. So you're gonna go up. And you're gonna go back down. And you always wanna make sure that you keep your fabric as flat as possible while also keeping your fingers out of the way of your needle. Um, easier said than done though, I know. Okay, so that is an example of a whip stitch here. All right, I'm gonna trim this off and then I'm gonna show you very quickly how to do a blanket stitch. Great. So Couple can... of uh, good questions yes. that have come in. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one question is asking, when you first knot the thread, do you use a quilter's knot? Sorry, can you repeat that? When you first knot the thread, do you uh -huh. use a do you use a quilter's knot? Um, I actually am not a quilter, so I didn't know that there's a specific knot for quilting. Um, I assume it's just a regular sewing knot. I know there are certain techniques where you roll the fabric, roll the thread down, and it literally rolls into the end of the thread. That's like a couture technique. So um, sure. uh, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry That's about okay. that. Yes, and I will show you how to use a thimble when I'm doing this blanket stitch now. So I have a thimble on the end of my middle finger here. Um, you want to get a thimble that fits your finger. They come in a few different sizes. Um, it really depends on how you like to push the, the needle and thread. Most people will probably put it on this middle finger. So I am gonna use it to both protect my hand and to push the thread through more quickly. Okay, so this is a visual example of a blanket stitch. And this is a really beautiful finish, finishing and um, functional stitch. So it's decorative and functional. The blanket stitch is often used to finish the edge of blankets, hence the name, and stuffed ornaments and to connect two pieces of fabric. It's made uh, by creating a strong starting stitch loop and then going under the open stitch loop with the needle and thread. I will show you in one second. This will create a continuous thread border along the raw edge. So this connected two cut edges of this fleece fabric. Rebecca, do you mind, um, would you be able to hold the fabric a little, I guess, higher up? Yeah, that's great. Oh, Because sometimes sure. it cuts off a little bit. Oh, apologies, sorry. You're okay, fine. great. Um, so this will create a continuous border here along the edge. And you might have seen this, like I said, on blankets that you bought from the store. Okay, great. Um, this is one that has to be done very cleanly and evenly. As you can see here, you want to make sure the spacing is all done very precisely. So to do a blanket stitch, you want to go through the inside of your two layers to hide the tail. You want to make a little loop back through where you first came through. And I'm using this to push through if I have any trouble. And it's similar to um, like a, almost like a crochet technique or a, a knitting technique. You want to pull it through the open hole tight, but not too tight. And then it's gonna wind up going over. So the next one, you wanna space evenly. And then you wanna pick up that open loop again. So the first few might look a little funny, but then it starts to come together and it looks really nice. So you wanna do it very delicately and make sure your edges are not pulled too tight. So going through, make the third one, and then back through the loop again. And then you just wanna even everything out. All 
All right. Rebecca, one um, yes. one attendee says the blanket stitch on corners is hard for them. Do you have any suggestions going around the corner? Um, it depends if you want a rounded corner or if you want more of a squared corner. I would, um, depending on what kind of material you're using, you know, fleece can be a little more forgiving. Um, I would say that a rounded corner tends to be a little easier because you're not going to have an edge poking out. But if you did want to do a corner, you could go back up and square it off. Like that. But obviously that still leaves a little bit of, you know, fabric at the end here that theoretically could come loose. Um, so if that's a big problem for you, then I would say trim it and then round it off like that. You can do the blanket stitch around that way. Hope that answers your question. Okay, great. All right, so we are gonna move along and learn how to attach adornments unless we wanna take our break now, Dana. Do you think now is a good time? You know, yeah, actually this is perfect. I've got 11.29 okay. on the clock, so. Okay, perfect. Right. Yeah, we are gonna do a short intermission. Um, so if folks just wanna keep practicing any of the stitches or get up and uh, get a glass of water, um, whatever, then uh, feel free. I'll talk for a couple minutes about our upcoming classes, as well as thanking our wonderful sponsor again. Um, so today we are in Learn to Sew by Hand. Um, if you're interested in that crochet shawl class that's still on this slide, uh, just send me an email. My email, I'll let you know at the end of the class. Um, or you can email events at primecp.com and I can send you that recording. That was a new class last week. Um, next week, we are doing Learn to Crochet, which is a rebroadcast class. If you, some of you have been talking in the chat about how you are interested in learning all sorts of different crafts. And if crochet is something you are interested in, that is our beginner level class that is airing next Tuesday on the 1st, also at 11 a.m. Central. I don't have um, our next class on the slide, of course, but I, folks who are in this class today would probably be interested in our class on Thursday, November 10th, which is learn to sew a quilted mug rug. So that one requires a sewing machine. Um, it's a brand new class taught by Marie Sigaris of Underground Crafter, and that is coming up on Thursday this time, um, Thursday the 10th. So keep an eye on favecrafts.eventbrite.com where we add new classes um, pretty much every week. And um, yeah, so that's what's going on. I'll drop that link in the chat as well. Thank you again to We Like Sewing. Um, this, because this is a digital paid digital magazine, there are no advertisements in the magazine and all of the patterns are professionally tech edited. So you know you're gonna get error-free um, ads free content. When you subscribe as a new member, you get access to the six annual issues that release as well as all of the back issues um, and all of the previously published patterns. It's just $5 US as a thank you for attending the class today. It's welikesewing.com slash webinar 22. All right, Rebecca, we are ready when you are to continue. Welcome back, everyone. Hi. Okay, so now we are going to talk about things that are slightly more fun, buttons and connectors and my favorite sequins. Okay, so to start, sewing on a button is much simpler than it looks and sounds. Buttons, like I mentioned before, are usually either solid in front with a loop on the back or flat with two holes or sometimes four holes. Great. So the most important thing to remember when sewing on a button 
is to leave a little room between the fabric and the button itself so that you have a little slack and room for the other uh, part of the fabric to sit comfortably, meaning it should not be too tight against the fabric. Winding the thread around this area under the button a few times will help reinforce it while also leaving a little bit of room. I am going to show you how to sew on two different kinds of buttons. Uh, before that, I'm going to show you what it looks like when it's sewn on. So you can see here a two hole button and simply uh, hand sewn through these two holes up and down. Here is a larger button with a loop on the back. And you can see here, especially where I went around to add a little bit more space. Okay, and the most important thing actually to remember when sewing on a button is that it needs to be secure because nobody likes having a button rip off in an important situation. Okay, great. So to sew on a button with a loop, you wanna start on the wrong side of your fabric. With your hand needle and thread, you want to go up. You want to go through the back and back down through. Now, when sewing on a button, it's really easy to get the thread all tangled and make a big mess of it. So take your time and you'll have a much better result. So you want to go back through the same part. several times. So I recommend about five times or so, depending on how um, thick your fabric is and the kind of thread you're using, etc. cetera. So um, once you go through enough times that it feels somewhat secure, you're gonna go back through another time and then you're gonna wind the thread, like I mentioned, you're gonna wind it around the very, very bottom here. I always do it probably more than I should, but I did it a good five times and then you can go back down through. Oh, you see, I have a little bit of extra thread here. So you don't be like me. You wanna make sure your thread is pulled tight each time you go through. And then you wanna knot it and then clip your thread off. Great. So to sew on a button with two or four holes, it's a very similar process, except for the thread will be visible. So you either wanna pick a thread that matches your fabric and your button so it doesn't show, or you can use a contrasting one. Okay, so to sew on a four hole button, a two hole button is the same concept. So on a four hole button, you wanna go up through one of the holes and just simply go across. And then back through and across. And again, do this about four or five times. And I am using a double thread here to make it go a little more quickly. And because I'm using a chunkier kind of fabric and button. And then you want to crisscross here. So I made an X here. Um, that's a good question. Some people prefer to do it parallel. I prefer the X. I think it seems a little bit stronger. So after you've done that a couple of times, you just want to make a knot and flip your thread off. Great. So another kind of connector besides a button that you might use in your sewing is a hook and eye. So a hook and eye, you might have seen like on the back of a bra or sometimes it's on the waistband of uh, nice trousers or skirt. A hook and eye is what it sounds like. It is a rounded end that's open and then it's a looped end that goes through it. 
So they come in a variety of shapes and sizes too. So this is a larger one I'm demonstrating on just so it's easy for you to see. But as I showed you before in the example, they also come in teeny tiny little sizes. So one is for one side and the other is for the other side of the material. So to sew on hook and eyes, it's a very similar concept than the buttons. You want to start from the wrong side. Now, if you're going to have a visible inside of your fabric, I suggest from starting underneath the hook and eye piece so it hides the little knot. So, oops. I'm going to make sure your thread tail is clipped so it's not sticking out. And then you want to go through however many holes your hook and eye closure has. And you can do this visibly, you can do it invisibly, depending on, um, you know, how much you want the different thread to show. So you want to go through enough times that it's totally secured here. And then you want to do the same for this other side here. You want to go up through this side and then through this other hole. But keep in mind that this won't be visible from this side. It will hook onto here. So ideally, you want to not see thread as much as possible. So it's going to hook on to this other side of the closure. OK, wonderful. So another kind of closure that you probably are familiar with that we use pretty much every day in our lives is a snap. And this is a two part two part connector consisting of a divoted part that goes down and then the snap part that goes down into it. And each one has to be sewn on each on uh, different sides of the fabric so that they can then snap together. So it's very similar to doing the other kinds of sewing. So it's just like sewing on the hook and eye but you want to go through the little tiny holes on the snap here. Okay. So to demonstrate, you want to make sure that you sew the correct side on, because when I was making your guys sample, I almost sewed it on backwards. So you want to make sure you're sewing the side that goes downwards, sticking down, and then the side that goes upwards, sticking up. And you want to do it very similar to sewing on a button. You want to just go through every one of these little holes until it's really secure and you're not going to be able to like rip it off because you have to think about the force that goes on when you're pulling a snap on and off. So you want to make sure it's really on there really, really, really well. And you want to sew both sides on. Okay, great. Did we have any questions before? Oh, um, Tips on how to line up a hook and eye. That's a really, really important question. Um, it depends partly on what kind of garment you're using, but one thing you can do is pin it on beforehand and kind of double check. Like here, it's sticking out a little bit too far. Um, so, you can bend it in. You want to make sure it's not hanging over, but this one I probably would make a little tiny bit further in. And then this side I would cover up with another piece of fabric here. Hopefully that answers your question. It's a tiny bit of trial and error for lining these up. We do have a few other yes. really good questions that have come yes. in. Um, Amy is asking, Going back to sewing, you know, the sewing stitches, what is the best way to tie off the end of the thread? Um, I would say just double go through with your needle again and then just literally bring it back through. I'll show you. Um, 
the more times you go through, the less likely it is going to be to come out. So let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do the sequins, and then I will also show you how to tie things off while I'm doing that. Awesome. A little more fun than closures. Everybody likes sequins because they're sparkly and they're fun and they definitely add a little, a little couture touch to any kind of garment or sewing project. So as you can see here, sequins are very tiny and fiddly and sometimes they stick together. You want to make sure you separate them all. As you can see here, they are cut in like layers and they can peel off. So um, an example here, I have three different ways you can sew on sequins. I have the first way is going just with one thread over. So it is movable on one side. The other is with two threads. So it is much less movable, but you're gonna see more of the visible thread. And then the third way, is by using a bead, it's a large-ish seed bead, to hold it on. So I'm gonna show you how to do all three of those very quickly, and then I will also show you how to tie off um, the end. Okay, so if you wanna just go through one time, you wanna start at the, oh, and, Sometimes sequins go flying, so there you go. Okay, so load a sequin onto your needle here. And you wanna make sure your needle is thin enough that the sequin can go through. Sometimes they don't fit, so you might have to play around with that a little bit. And then you're gonna simply just go through on one side. Pull it through, make sure you don't have a bunch of loose threads and it's secure. And then you can go through one more time to tack it down. If I was gonna cut it off, go under here, pull, and then to really secure things before you tie them off, go through a second time. and then go through your loop, pull it tight, and then you have a very secure knot on the back. So if I even tried, I might not be able to pull that off right now. So hopefully that answered that question. Okay, so to sew on a sequin that is tacked down a little more strongly, you wanna go through two times. And so I recommend going like opposite sides. So I did it down here at the bottom and I would go through the top. All right. And you can go through the center or the edge. So as you can see here, it's secured with two threads and it's very, very secure on the back here. Um, because sequins is kind of delicate and does come off, like I said, I recommend tying or at least double knotting or securing each one as you go along. And now for the third way to sew on sequins, go up through the back, put your sequin on your needle and this is an example of, your, of hand sewing thread getting tangled on the back. You wanna try to avoid those kind of tangles. They always happen, but try to smooth them out as you go along if possible. You want your sequin down on here, and then you wanna load your little seed bead. You can even use a tinier one if your needle will allow it to go through. Your seed bead is actually gonna hold it on so you won't see thread around there. You're gonna go back through the same hole. J 
gently. And as you can see here, the seed bead helped secure the sequin. And this is nice if you wanna add a lot of texture and you could put like a lot of them together in one area. You could do some that have a bead, some that don't. It's really whatever your imagination wants you to do. Okay, so do we have any questions? Oh, is there a right or wrong side of the sequin? Um, that is up to you. Like any crafting supply, really, you can make of it what you will. Um, traditionally, a sequin is used with the, the bubbly side on top, but you could even add some really beautiful texture by mixing those up. So to answer, there is not necessarily a right way, but some of them might have a different color on the inside and the outside. Um, here is another example of a larger kind of pilot sequin type adornment that you can sew on by hand. And these just have two holes. And these are really pretty. You can use them like for the center of a flower, or any kind of adornment to add a little sparkle. So those are sewn on a very similar way, but just with the two holes. Okay, wonderful. Um, did we have any other questions about adornments or connectors before I move on to the last segment about repairing garments? Yeah, um, we. I, there's been so many wonderful questions. I'm like having yes. a hard time keeping up and I, oh, I want to make sure okay. we have time for the, the last part of the class. Um, somebody was asking, there's something called button thread. Have you used it? Do you know why use button thread instead of regular thread? Um, I have not used button thread. I'm guessing it probably is just a thicker kind of thread that might be stronger. Um, I went to fashion school, but I've never heard of button thread, but that's actually really cool because I like doing these classes. I'm learning something new myself. Um, I'm guessing it's probably a, a thicker kind of thread. Um, so. Great. Okay. And then we've got a lot of questions about, you know, do you have any tips for sewing on Velcro or nylon? Um, or, you know, various oh, materials. Want, yeah. Yeah. Um, Velcro can be a little tricky because it has, you know, the little little teeth and the other side. Um, I would just suggest the needle choice is really important. You want to use a really sharp needle that's able to go through it and just make sure that you attach it all around um, with a thread color that blends in. Um, if you're sewing a kind of material that and you keep having a thread that is breaking, then I would use a more slippery thread like a silk thread um, that's that's easier to slide through on like thicker knits that kind of thing hey. wonderful thanks rebecca sure. hopefully i'm answering everybody's questions so all right so for our last segment uh, we are going to discuss how to repair garments by hand, and that is definitely one of the advantages of knowing how to hand sew. You can um, fix things, it helps add to the life of your garments, and you don't have to always be getting new things. You can fix some of your older things and keep them for longer. So I'm going to demonstrate on a piece of denim fabric, and that is a fabric that is very easy to tear because a lot of people, you know, wear jeans and they get worn out. So here I have like a rounded tear. And then I also have like, you know, a little, a little slip. So this is very common that happens with denim, right? So um, I'm gonna show you two different ways to repair fabric by hand. So you wanna use your fabric scissors or if your other scissors are sharp enough, trim off any excess around here. This isn't fraying too badly. Um, denim obviously is known for fraying. So if it's gotten like really out of control fray, you wanna make sure you cut off these like extra little pieces here 
because it'll make your repair look nicer and go more smoothly. So um, I'm going to repair this slit here first. So say you made a little cut in your jeans. I'm actually always having to repair my husband's stuff. So this is very handy to know. Start from the back. And I would also clean up here where you have like a little bit of excess threads and everything. The cleaner you start when you're making a repair, generally the better your result will be. Okay, so starting from the back side. Now, if I wanted it to blend in a little more, I would have, uh, I'd be using a thread that matches this denim exactly, but hopefully you can see on here. So you literally want to hold the two pieces together and just do a whip stitch along it. And you want to make sure when you're doing a repair, you hold the fabric flat so you're not getting a bunch of puckering. So you could see here the threads are visible, but if I was using a dark blue denim colored, fat, colored thread, it would not be as visible. Okay, so like our other project, our other uh, elements of a project, we are gonna go back through here, secure it it twice just to be safe and then you're going to clip that off so it's not necessarily very beautiful but it's functional and if like I said if the thread was matching it would honestly be really hard to tell that there was a tear right there even be even with uh, denim having that white underneath okay now for the last type of repair I'm going to show you so if you have a larger hole that you can't just sew straight across, you want to, again, trim. So it's nicer and it's flat and trim on both sides. And I'm using a piece of felt here. You know, you can use store-bought patches. You can make your own. You could cut this into a cute shape. And I'm literally going to use embroidery floss. Oh, somebody just asked this question. So I am going to take this piece of felt here, place it over my hole, start from the back. And I am using embroidery floss and this felt to. So on a patch. So you would continue and go all around. And I am using obviously a contrasting thread. So you can see. Alternatively, you can do a patch from the back. So it would be less visible. Um, so if you want to sew a patch on here in the same color, you can even use the same denim fabric then that would help disguise that hole there. Okay, so I'm just using a simple whip stitch here and I would sew it all around and then that's an easy way to patch a tear in denim. All right, so that concludes my presentation for today. And thank you all so much for attending. Hopefully you were able to see relatively well. Um, and I hope that this class really helped you improve and build on your sewing skills and become much more confident hand sewing. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, we have a couple minutes left. If you, uh, there are a couple of questions if you've got time, Great. Rebecca. Yes. Cool. Um, Elaine was asking, is there a preference of what type of thread, cotton versus polyester versus combo in general to use? Um, I recommend, um, some people have personal preference. I generally recommend using an all-purpose thread, and these are like a poly cotton blend, typically. 
Um, some threads will be 100% polyester. Some will be a blend. Um, as you see here, these are both 100% polyester. So I think these work really well for like a variety of projects. You can use them literally for almost everything, except for maybe if you're sewing like a really chunky wool, that kind of thing, then I would recommend using something like a silk thread. Um, uh, embroidery floss is a cottony type of thread. Um, but you can also find it in like sparkly colors, all kinds of things. So if you want more of a decorative thread, this is definitely the way to go. Now it's so many of the comments are, are thank yous and everyone's so oh, excited. And thank you. Yes. Yeah, they, they learn new things. Some people said, you know, they've been hand sewing a long time, but never learned the blanket stitch, for example, or, yeah. or you know, different tips and tricks. So yay. Um, I am going to just share the screen one last time um, because I want to encourage folks to follow Rebecca on her various social media and website um, links. If you if you loved learning from Rebecca today, if you want to check out some of her work, Rebecca's on Etsy. She has an Instagram, Facebook, Twitter profile. You can visit her site, purpleandlime.com. Uh, um, if you have any questions that weren't answered during the class today, there was there was a really specific question about sewing a nylon raincoat, for example. Um, feel free to email me, and I can put you in touch with Rebecca, or you know we can we can I can address your questions as well. Um, you can also reach out to me if you have any questions about our classes in general. Um, I would be the point person for that. So Dean Neal at primecp.com or you can get me at events at primecp.com as well. Thank you again so much, Rebecca. Thank you to our sponsor, We Like Sewing, and hopefully we see everyone at some future classes. All right, have a good day.